Hello and welcome to another Comedic How-To Guide. I'm your host, Sharon. And you may have noticed on the channel I've been doing some live broadcasts. Uh, we're trying to do this every Friday at 7. Of course, we're doing this for the duration of the uh, uh, stay-at-home period. And uh, that's even when that ends, you know, which may be too soon, we'll have to see. Uh, I hope to keep doing this and, you know, make it a regular thing. We've really been enjoying it so far and you know why not let's keep going in the meantime I have some book reviews uh, I promised a few of them somebody has specifically asked about the first book that we're gonna go ahead and talk about and this is Daily Life of the Egyptian Gods by Dimitri Meeks and Christine Favard Meeks uh, it was originally written in French and uh, was translated uh, by G.M. Goshgarian. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, it's copyright about 1993, the original French. Um, and a lot of people in comedic circles have asked me about this book. And, uh, you know, well, what, what did I think of it? I finally got a chance to read it not too long ago. <sighs> It's definitely interesting. It draws on texts that are only available in French, and uh, so it's a resource for information that's not very easily accessible in uh, English-speaking sources. And that's something that I noticed there's a real problem with uh, uh, things that you know were translated in French. And if you want to study Egyptology, you have to be able to read articles in the original French and German and uh, uh, it's not that often that they get translated into English li like this one. So uh, there's kind of a, a language barrier there for some information. And books like this definitely are a help for that. Um, but uh, it also gives a different perspective on sources that are in English, such as the Coffin Text, the Book of the Dead, and uh, Magical Spells, because they've, they've been translated into English and also into French and German. And um, what's interesting is some of the things that they mention in here, it kind of made me, you know, want to go back and look through the footnotes and find uh, the, the sources in English. For example, uh, the book describes the different color eyes that different deities have, and says that uh, a tomb, the creator aspect of Ra, had green eyes. And that was supposed to be in one of the uh, spells from the Book of the Dead. So I said, okay, well, let me go and look up chapter 32 in the Book of the Dead. And sure enough, the last paragraph of it says, I am one whose eyes are green. What exists is in my grasp. What does not exist is in my belly. I am clad and equipped with your magic, O Ra, even this which is above me and below me. You know, going on at the very end, it says, I am Ra, who, protects him, who himself protects himself and nothing can harm me. Uh, so this this was a spell for uh, repelling a crocodile, uh, but uh, in it the speaker assumes the identity of different deities, and presumably in the last one it says, you know, I am Ra, you know, one whose eyes are green. Um, it's a little bit interpretive, but um, again, these these are little things that they picked up on that made me curious, and it's the kind of thing that if you've got any of these sources, it, you know, and you read you know, daily life of the Egyptian gods, it make, makes you want to go back and reread the original sources. But, as I said, it's kind of interpretive with some of that information, and that's the biggest problem that I have with this book, is it's very, very interpretive. The approach that they take is to kind of forget the humans exist and that, you know, deities are worshipped by humans, and then look at them as, you know, uh, a family, or like a, you know, um, the subject of you know, anthropologists or something. In taking this approach, for one, um, they interpret a lot of things very heavily, and they pass character judgments on deities, present them the, basically as a, a squabbling family. And um, a lot of the character judgments that they make in here don't square with the experiences that modern worshippers get from these same deities. For example, you know, and I've Got a bookmark in here. Um, it says, you know, uh, Toth was wise but boring or even a wee bit pompous. Um, Ra, the supreme divinity, uh, was occasionally somewhat weak and indecisive. Um, Isis, the mother and weeping widow, 
Um, in fact, she was rather cold and proud. Um, and also say, it goes on to say about Osiris, you know, that uh, it must be emphasized that Osiris could, under normal circumstances, display great cruelty or else a certain callousness. You know, for he would occasionally let all the genies in his surface torture one of the deceased. You know, well, if you take them out of context, then yeah, you might be able to say something like that. But again, that doesn't square with uh, what a lot of us who, you know, approach them from the modern day have experienced with them. And when you look at the gods in the context of how they were worshipped originally, you also don't get that same impression. So that, I think, is um, one of the reasons why even other academic writers in reviewing this book have taken issue with the approach that they, they did with it. And uh, I think by trying to take all of these different sources from, you know, the pyramid texts going way back in Egyptian history through the Book of the Dead, and then later texts, you know, which span a very long period of time, and trying to condense all of this down, it's almost like they're taking the uh, DC Zero Hour approach to this, for those of you who are familiar with comics. Uh, and, you know, that kind of skews the whole picture. So, um, in sum, on this book, I would say, in terms of information, it's very interesting. And again, uh, it refers to uh, texts that, you know, otherwise we might not hear of because they were originally in French. But I would not recommend anyone read this book for the purpose of trying to get to know their gods that they want to worship. This is not a good book for pagans because it doesn't put any of them in a good light and it kind of ignores the fact that we're here. You know, or even that the ancient Egyptians were there and, you know, were worshipping these gods. So, uh, you know, definitely take this book with a grain of salt if you have it. Now, the next book, actually I have a couple of books here by the same authors, but we'll start with Egyptian Paganism. Bring the Gods and Goddesses of Ancient Egypt into Daily Life. I don't know if that's actually part of the title or not. No. Um... Maybe, but it's by Jocelyn Almond and Keith Seddon. This particular book comes up in lists on, you know, ancient Egyptian, you know, paganism, you know, uh, all this stuff. I've seen it in Amazon listed right next to mine. Um, it was there before mine was, and so I've been wanting to read this for a long time. I finally got a hold of a copy of it. And... I had problems with it from chapter one, paragraph one. <sighs> Let's start off. Okay, for one, they give the uh, pronunciation of the Egyptian word for deity as Nietzsche. I realize that uh, we're not certain on how any of you know, the, the words in ancient Egyptian language were pronounced with any sort of ironclad certainty. But what you have to understand is that w the way these words are rendered now, half of the E's that you find in them are basically space vowels. We don't know what the original vowel sounds were, so we put an E in there. And trying to give uh, rules of the Queen's English to it, saying Nietzsche, or the Earth God as Gib, um... The reason why I don't think that works is because the E sound probably would have been spelled with the iron, um, you know, or the, the doubled reed rather than, you know, a space. So, um, right from like the first sentence, I'm like, <laughs> no. But it goes beyond that. That's actually kind of a quibble compared to further issues with this book. Because then they go on to say on page six, that uh, they, they quote um, Eric Hornung's uh, Conceptions of God in Ancient Egypt, the one and the many. That's a book that a lot of people like to quote, but it seems like they don't read the whole damn book. And I'll get to that in a minute. But they describe the ancient Egyptian religion as a mon mon monolatry, henotheism, the idea that all of the other gods are an emanation of the original creator. 
So are you the ones responsible for this? If you watch any of my videos, you know that I have a real problem with that interpretation, and I give reasons why, you know, and this is something that has come about in several other uh, schools of Egyptian paganism slash Kemeticism, but I'm starting to wonder if these are the folks who started it. Let me get to that in just a minute. Another problem with, these bo with this particular book and the other ones by the same author uh, is that they start drawing from a lot of unrelated concepts and linking them to ancient Egypt, um, such as the Zodiac, the Twelve Constellations, you know, the Age of Leo, the Age of Aquarius, all that. That didn't exist in the beginnings of Egyptian civilization. Our Zodiac is a Greek development based off of the Babylonian system and has nothing to do with the Egyptian one. We still don't know all of the Egyptian constellations. We certainly don't know all of the, the deacons um, as they were originally understood. And that changed over time, too, because of procession. Also, this book mentions kundalini, ki, uh, chakras. Those are Asian concepts, which we don't have any record of that as, it was under, as the concepts are known now in ancient Egypt. So, if you're an eclectic pagan and you like combining concepts, you know, like from, you know, uh, Asian traditions in with that, that's okay, but understand that you are taking modern concepts and blending them. There's no proof that uh, uh, the idea of Sekhem or power had, was anything like Kundalini energy as it's understood in Hinduism. But they try to say that in this book. Take that with a grain of salt. Now, it's obvious as I read this that uh, the authors are trained in Western ceremonial magic. Uh, it's not Wicca, it's Western ceremonial magic, um, which is a different thing. Um, there's some similarities, and, and they do things like they, uh, they describe a circle casting in here. And uh, if, you know, if, if you do that kind of ritual work, then, you know, uh, that's fine. Um, it's interesting, they used the Four Sons of Horus, and um, I wrote a circle casting uh, that also uses the Four Sons of Horus um, before I ever read this book. So, you know, um, obviously thinking in the same direction. Um, this book also gives a very shortened opening of the mouth and suggests that she use that for uh, consecrating altar statues and stuff like that. So people who have criticized me for doing it, hey, I'm not the only one. Also, uh, I can tell that this is influenced by Western ceremonial magic because they make a distinction between high and low magic. And um, if you're uh, part of a system that makes that distinction, then you'll probably feel comfortable with this. If not, you know. And uh, ancient Egyptian religion didn't make a distinction between high and low magic either. Now, chapters 5 and 8 of this book deal with uh, evoking and invoking entities and uh, assuming the god form, um, basically channeling. Um, these are very difficult and frankly hazardous spiritual activities to do. I won't even attempt them. Um, that's, you know, you have to have someone who is really gifted in order to do that and um, it's not something that should be taken lightly. And I realize that theurgy, you know, is a big part of Western ceremonial magic. And that's probably why it gets so much attention in here, because that's how they roll. But, um, you do not need it to worship the ancient Egyptian gods. Kids, don't try this at home. What's really funny about it is, again, they quoted, uh, Eric Hornung's book, Funny, he had something to say about channeling as well, and I have it bookmarked. On page 207 in Conceptions of God in Ancient Egypt, he says, The Egyptians evidently never experience a longing for union with the deity. They keep their distance from the gods, whom no one can approach too closely without being punished. But their hopes for the next world are based on becoming like a god, 
on assuming the role of one of the great gods and thus themselves affecting the course of the world. So in other words, he says, and he went on to say that there is no mysticism of that type in Egyptian religion, so he says they would not have tried to assume the god form. Now, since we're here, what was it that he had to say about henotheism? Well, uh, he's, he starts off quoting um, a lecture that someone gave about uh, Indian religion and comparing it to Egyptian religion. Each god is to the mind of the supplicant as good as all the gods. He's felt uh, at, the same, at the time as a real divinity, as supreme and absolute, in spite of the necessary limitations um, which to our mind a plurality of gods must entail. That's from someone else, uh, Max Muller. Uh, Horner himself goes on to say, the term henotheism, which was coined by Schelling and adopted by Muller, was taken over by Lepage Renouf, von Strauss und Tony, Weidemann, and many others to describe this worship of one god at a time, but not of a single god. The term monolatry, which has been proposed by Eric Winter, uh, or would it be Winter, and Siegfried Morens, has, also, has long been used for Near Eastern conceptions of God, also describes well the nature of this attitude to the divine which still lives on in Hinduism. I noticed that a lot of people like to refer to that book, but again, they don't read the whole thing and they don't understand the nuance in there. A better way that I can illustrate what Horna means about this, this henotheism, this idea of uh, focusing on one at a time, I can explain very simply. I love you, Starscream. You're the best. I love you, Galvatron. You're the best. Now, did me saying, gee, Galvatron, you're the best, suddenly negate Starscream being the best? Well, if you ask Galvatron, the answer is yes. But in actuality, no. Because at the moment, that I have my attention focused on Starscream, he is the best. But when I turn around and, and devote all of my attention to Galvatron, he is the best. That's with something that you enjoy and adore, you know, a milder form of it, but in worship, saying that Amun is the creator, he is, you know, the best, the greatest, um, that does not conflict with the idea of turning around and addressing another deity, be it Jehuti, be it Ra, be it even Mut, uh, the wife of Amun, as the greatest, as the sole one, the unique one, the creatress, um, or creator, as Ra or another god. That doesn't mean that, uh, wait a minute, you know, because in our minds we think, okay, there has to be a logically ordered system, and one of them has to be at the very top to the exclusion of the others. The idea that they're describing there says any of them could be at a given time, but it doesn't mean that the others are suddenly subsumed into that one. It just means that, you know, the uh, energy of devotion is being focused on one at a time in the right context. But there are plenty of others where uh, you read, you know, hymns and things like that where they're addressing multiple deities at once. It, it's a lot of unnecessary mental gymnastics, if you ask me, to try to uh, set up all of the other deities as somehow being just emanations of the One, when we know that there are plenty of instances where they're all treated as independently existing entities. And that's even explained in a lot of scholarly sources, but people like to take them out of context and just quote little bits. <sighs> All right, part two of this book lists major deities and includes texts related to them. Um, and I recognize a lot of them. One quibble that I have is that uh, for Amun, they give the monologue of the Creator that is supposed to be attributed to a tomb. It comes from the coffin texts, and it uh, technically predates Amun being elevated to the position of you know, creator assimilated with Ra, but they go ahead and put it in here. Never mind the fact that there are plenty of other texts for Amun that you could put. <sighs> they also claim that Neith, 
was married to Set at one point. And I want to know where they got this. This is the second volume of a two-volume work on the goddess Neith of Sais. It's in French, and I've been working on this, and I have yet to find in it what it is that they're talking about. It might be in here somewhere, but uh, I haven't seen it yet. They also spend 17 pages talking about Isis. Really? And only three pages on men, two pages on Khonsu. There's, there's kind of a, a, an obvious, like, I mean, yes, Isis, Isis, rah, 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 we all know Isis. But um, a lot of folks, I think, would also take issue, uh, the folks that uh, are devotees of Set would probably take issue with their interpretation of him here as, you know, manifesting the lower self. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Y'all have fun with that argument. Uh, and they also point out that Horus is one god with many aspects, but they still break him into two chapters. Why? It's funny. The anticipation for me on this book was uh, much better than reading the actual book. Um, again, if, if ceremonial magic is your bag, then they have another book that uh, I can recommend. But as for this one itself... Don't even bother. You might actually see this other book of theirs, also by Jocelyn Allman and Keith Seddon, in two different forms. The older one is An Egyptian Book of Shadows, Eight Seasonal Rites of Egyptian Paganism. And that accurately describes what it's about. Now, it was reprinted by the same publisher as the Book of Egyptian Ritual, Simple Rites and Blessings for Every Day. These are not blessings for every day. This is a wheel of the year. It goes from Imolk, or Imbolc, to Yule. And, uh, you know, I can understand most of the stuff that they put in here. Some of theirs, uh, the, the uh, Egyptian Wiccan Wheel of the Year that I wrote ended up being very similar. They put the harvest of men at the fall equinox instead of the vernal equinox, but okay. Um, there are some practical drawbacks to this book, though. For one, it's written for a coven. Uh, the smallest number that they envision, I think, in here is three people. So that's no help to you if you're a solitary, and that happens to be most of us. Um, you'd have to find, you'd, you'd basically be reading all the parts in here. Um, it also uses the classical form of English, you know, the eye of Horus liveth, yea, liveth. Um, and I'm not saying that's bad, it's just, um, it's rather difficult, certainly for us folks here in America, um, but possibly even for folks in other parts of the English-speaking world. Um, that's kind of a debate unto itself about, you know, uh, should we continue to use uh, the classical forms of, you know, you know, Elizabethan English, you know, um, because it, it makes me think of, you know, Shakespearean uh, usage. Is that still appropriate for ritual purposes? You know, there are disagreements on that. I found that if you're working with an open circle and you're kind of rounding up people and, and saying, here, would you like to read this? Would you like to read that? You've got to make things easy to read. And um, a lot of books, not, not just these, but other books that don't use the classical form of English um, have that problem of their, their text being very difficult to read unless you've really cozied up with it and spent a lot of time with it. And because this is more, you know, Western ceremonial magic, and uh, theurgy is, you know, the aim of much of their, their rites, you don't have any other activities in here, any other things that they would consider low magic, you know, raising a cone of power, or anything like that in here. Um, so, and there's no everyday rites, so I don't know why they put that in the title when they reissued the book. Um, so again, if Western ceremonial magic is your bag, then uh, go for it you might find something you like in here. Otherwise, um, oddly enough, if you had to get books other than mine, 
because I've put a lot of things in Following the Sun in the revised edition, uh, Circle of the Sun, um, and you know my other books that address a lot of the problems that I talk about. You know, I've written it with an eye for solitaries, um, covering things from a Kemetic and from an Egyptian Wicca standpoint. You know, uh, and from more of a, a polytheistic standpoint. Um, but if you had to look to some other books, if there were any that I would recommend, oddly enough, it would be A Circle of Isis. And as hard as I wrote that book, Eye of the Sun actually had some decent rituals in it that I could tell were based on real Egyptian texts, and they weren't borrowing from extraneous sources. This would be, you know, something legitimately comedic. So if you had to get something other than mine, I would say those two books, and these guys, I'd eat these books, but I'm not that hungry. <laughs> so, hopefully, as you're shopping at home and looking for other things to read, stuff to do while we're staying at home to avoid the pandemic, um, this is giving you a little bit of information on what to look at and what to avoid. You know, and what things to maybe put at the bottom of your priority list. And like, well, you know, because, I mean, if, if you want to read it just to, to see what I'm complaining about, that's, that's one thing. But if you're looking for things to seriously add to your knowledge base, um, again, uh, the only one of the books that I just reviewed that maybe I'd say put on there would be Daily Life of the Egyptian Gods. But again, not if you're looking for something to give you... Uh, thoughts on how to in, interpret the gods in a modern context. So, sorry I don't have anything, you know, that I can say, oh yeah, this is really good, but I'm not going to sit here and talk up something that I don't think is very reliable for you. That said, um, I invite you to join us on Friday uh, for another live ritual. Um, join us on Patreon. My Patreon supporters got to see this video first. And uh, I'm also working on exclusive content just for Patreon. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. In the meantime, be safe, be well. Senebti and Agaliuja. Enjoyed this video? Then be sure to hit like and subscribe to the Comedic Independent channel. You can also buy my books on lulu.com and shop for pagan supplies in my Etsy store. Check the description for links. And special thanks to all my Patreon supporters. Join us for updates, outtakes, and exclusive videos only on Patreon.